This is a Commitment 2020 special in partnership with the New Hampshire Institute of Politics, the Granite State Debates. A guy by the name of Matt is going to be your congressman. One has spent decades in New Hampshire politics. The other was a part of the Trump administration. Two Republicans vying in the primary for New Hampshire's first congressional district say Democrats have dropped the ball when it comes to helping Granite Staters. But in a time when coronavirus relief, social justice, and the economic health of the country are at the forefront, they're bringing two very different perspectives to the table. And now it's time for New Hampshire voters to make a choice. I have a New Hampshire first approach. He has a Washington-based approach. I'm always gonna represent the people of New Hampshire. You can't drain the swamp by just skimming the top. I'm gonna keep my word to my constituents. Tonight, the Republican candidates for the first congressional district. Good evening and thank you for tuning in to tonight's Granite State Debate. I'm WMUR political director, Adam Sexton. Tonight we have two men who have never run for federal office, but they're confident they can do a better job protecting New Hampshire's interests than the freshman congressman currently representing the first district. Matt Mayberry has served as a Dover City Councilor, a Commissioner of Human Rights for New Hampshire, and the Vice Chair of the State Republican Party. Matt Maurer served as Executive Director of the State Party and worked on Chris Christie's 2016 presidential campaign and as a Senior Advisor to President Trump's Secretary of State. Now, WMUR News 9 evaluated all legally qualified candidates and selected those considered most newsworthy according to its objective criteria to participate in this debate. The candidates will get one minute to answer questions tonight. 30-second rebuttals will be allowed at the moderator's discretion. Our panelists tonight are WMUR anchor Monica Hernandez and WMUR political reporter John DeStaso. As we keep a safe distance here in the studio, the candidates are also staying safe in separate rooms at the New Hampshire Institute of Politics at St. Anselm College. We do want to note we are recording this debate instead of broadcasting live. To start things off tonight, we have asked each candidate to tell us how they would make New Hampshire a better place. And we begin with Mr. Mayberry. Well, good evening and thank you. And thank you for watching tonight. I'm Matt Mayberry. I'm a realtor, small business owner, and a veteran. I got into this race because Chris Pappas failed us. He failed us monumentally, especially with our veteran community. And I take that pledge to my fellow veterans very seriously. I'm the former commissioner of human rights for the state of New Hampshire. I produce gun shows, the largest and the best in our country, correction, in our state, that I will work hard for you every single day because we grand staters, we take challenges seriously, we rise to the occasion, and I look forward to, for the next hour to earning your vote and your support, please, on September 8th. Mr. Bowers, how would you make New Hampshire better? Well, Adam, thank you so much. And John and Monica, thank you as well for having us. You know, look, my name's Matt Mowers. I got into this race because two years ago, Chris Pappas said he would be different. He said he would work with both sides of the aisle. He said he would oppose Nancy Pelosi. And he said he would work with the president. He did none of that. In fact, he was the first Trump district Democrat in the country to support impeaching our president. I'll take a very different outlook. I'm going to represent the people of New Hampshire, not forget them the way that Chris Pappas has. I'm going to remember middle class families like the one I grew up in. My dad was a construction worker. It's a job that had us move around a lot like a lot of middle class families did. I'm not going to forget our law enforcement here in New Hampshire like Chris Pappas has when he voted to take away critical protections for them to do their job. And by the way, on a side note, I just want to wish well Chief Capano from Manchester, who just announced his retirement as well. But I'll make sure I always have their back. Thank you, Mr. Bowers. Our first panel question comes tonight from Monica Hernandez. Well, thank you, gentlemen. And right now, life is stressful. People are worried that the COVID-19 pandemic is going to surge again, leading to school shutdowns, more outbreaks at nursing homes, and another economic downturn. How can you assure people that you have the right ideas to help Congress navigate these times? Mr. Mowers. Well, thank you so much, Monica. People can know that I know what I'm talking about because I've done this before. In fact, I was chief of staff in our global health office and actually helped run our global HIV program in the State Department. I've seen firsthand how you control, can control a deadly epidemic that folks thought was uncontrollable. And you do it by bringing in the private sector. You make sure that you're investing in new therapeutics and therapies for people. You're making sure that you ramp up testing and diagnostic capabilities. You have to work with the private sector when we're trying to ensure that there's key components of our supply chain that are made here in the United States as well. I mean, what this crisis has uh, shown us is that we're way too reliant on China for manufacturing key pharmaceutical ingredients or uh, agriculture ingredients, as well as PPE. And I'm kind of tired of seeing a bunch of planes land from Shanghai for our PPE. We can make it here in America. 
not only will that be in the best interest of American workers, but will also be in our best national security interest as well. And sure, we're prepared for the next pandemic should it arise. Mr. Mayberry, your response? Absolutely. President Trump has done a great job in handling the crisis. Governor Sununu has done an amazing job. But those who I'm most proud of are the people of New Hampshire, us Granite Staters. When law enforcement needed hand sanitizer, I was called by a chief of police. I went out and found 200 gallons of it. When the Hillsborough County Sheriff's Department needed 2,000 face masks, I found them and brought them there. We all went to restaurants to help them stay open. We did our part. I helped deliver 200 meals to the Stratford County Meals on Wheels to shut in low-income seniors. Granite State has rose to this occasion. We excelled, we exceeded expectations, and because of that, we're one of the lowest in the country. In April, I did a prayer vigil, because I believe in the power of God, and I believe in the power of prayer. We had 400 people call into our service. We pulled, this, we pulled the state together, united in prayer, and we're in pretty good shape right now. Next question comes from John DeStaso. Thank you, Adam. Good evening, gentlemen. Mr. Mayberry, in an interview in June, you told me that you were in support of a more aggressive reopening of the economy. You said then that when you go out, you don't wear a face mask, and you were one of the first candidates, if not the first, to resume in-person campaign events. You said, quote, you're an individual and you're responsible for your own health and your own actions. I take live free or die seriously. Question is, does the spike in cases across the nation, while not in New Hampshire, concern you and should the president take stronger steps, including a mask mandate to stop the spread? I hate any kind of federal mandate. I think that's wrong. We live in the live free or die state, not the live free and comply state. It's up to the individual. You provide education and you make decisions. I wear a mask when I go into stores and say, please wear a mask. It's their small business and I want to honor their wishes. That I felt that we could have had the golf courses opened earlier. We could have opened the beaches a little bit earlier. But that was the governor's call, not mine. I live in Dover, New Hampshire. And so where I sit with this is let individuals and adults decide what's best for them and absolutely no federal mandates and no tracking of any kind. And Mr. Mowers, you were with President Trump last Friday night in Londonderry at a rally with an estimated 2,500 people. Hundreds were not wearing masks and many booed when they were told that they must. Did you wear one and was the president right to ignore social distancing restrictions by allowing more people into the venue? Well, John, I was uh, honored to be with the President of the United States on Friday night when he reiterated his endorsement of my campaign. Uh, it was an honor to be there. I did wear a mask. You know, as the President has said, wearing a mask is, in his words, patriotic. Uh, and I would encourage folks to wear a mask when it makes sense. But I'm absolutely opposed to a federal or a state mandate for mask wearing. Uh, you know, ultimately, this is up to individuals to uh, choose their best health care outcomes. We've seen too often when bureaucrats are trying to make decisions on health care for American families. In fact, Chris Pappas and Nancy Pelosi continue to push for more and more government intrusion in our health care system. They're trying to have bureaucrats make decisions for granite staters and their families. That's the wrong approach. We need to empower individuals to give them the information and tools necessary to make decisions. You know, we did that in the Global HIV program. We ensure that there was the most data available for individuals to make the best decisions, for community health care workers to make the best decisions. That's how you tackle an epidemic. You empower people with information, you provide the tools and resources and material necessary, and then you encourage the, the most you can based upon the data that's available. Follow up here, Mr. Mowers. Why do you think mask wearing has become so political? Well, unfortunately, I think you've seen politics at play in this, Adam, from day one of this crisis. You know, I was the first candidate in the country to call for a travel ban from China back in January. The president then implemented that ban just days later. When he did so, when I called for it, we were called all sorts of names by the other side of the aisle. When in retrospect, we know it was the right decision to make. In fact, it gave us ample time to then ramp up our capabilities as we're still trying to figure out exactly what this virus was. But there's been politics being played from day one from this. It's not how it should be. We should be using data, we should be using evidence, and we should be giving people the best information possible to actually make decisions at a granular level. We shouldn't be uh, just working off of emotion the way too many people are right now. It has to be based in facts. And that's how we're going to ensure that we can safely reopen the way that we are. Mr. Mayberry, why do you think wearing a mask has become so political? They've expanded beyond it. When the 
The first COVID bill came through and they gave $25 million to the Kennedy Center. That told the people of New Hampshire right away, this is now a political process. This is beyond controlling a pandemic. It was nothing but a market basket for every Democrat to put in their pet projects. Why did the Kennedy Center need $25 million? I think they want to try to embarrass the president, fund their own pet projects, and that was just wrong. It's not the New Hampshire way. We look at problems here in New Hampshire, we come together and solve them. We work together, we move forward, and that's the kind of congressman I will be. I want to take grand state solutions, grand state values to Washington and deny the Kennedy Center $25 million. Next question comes from Monica Hernandez. Well, right now, Congress is still debating a second stimulus bill. We've heard from Granite Staters who say, while unemployment benefits help those who are out of work, they are putting themselves at risk just by going to work. Should the federal government make sure essential workers get hazard pay during the pandemic? And should that include teachers and school staff who have recently been designated essential? Mr. Mowers. Well, thank you for the question, Monica. Look, what's so important is for these reopening decisions to be made at the local and the state level. And we've seen that here in New Hampshire. The governor has put forth a plan to allow schools to reopen in a way that ensures that local school boards have the decisions necessary and the ability to make the decisions necessary with input from teachers and parents, the way it should be. Uh, same with moving our economy and getting that reopened. We need to do so in a way that is safe and allows people to ensure that their health and well-being is there. Now, when it comes to the next COVID relief bill, we have ample resources already applied uh, right now. We have over $100 billion in PPP funding that was unspent. I do believe we need to ensure that that's open for businesses that have been disproportionately affected by COVID-19, mostly restaurants and hospitality industry, as well as seasonal businesses. Those are solutions that we should be talking about. Instead, we see politics being played by Chris Pappas and Nancy Pelosi when they reject any deal that the White House is offering them. It's politics, and they're putting that first instead of people. Mr. Mayberry. And I want to augment what Mr. Mowers just said by saying the $600 a week unemployment benefit that came through is actually hindering the opening of our small businesses. It's stalling our economy from growing because what's happening is people are saying, I'm making more money by staying home than I am at work. I talk to small businesses, restaurants, hotels, manufacturers. They can't find their employees to get back to work. And that's wrong. That's stalling our recovery. We have the, place, we have the apparatus in place to do business safely, effectively. We need to get our workers back on the job, back with our economy, and let's continue to grow. We had the best economy in history going before COVID hit. Let's get back to that point. point. John DeStaso with the next question. Thank you. As schools around the state reopened during the pandemic, many school district officials say the CARES Act funding they received will likely not be enough to meet all their expenses. In July, Governor Sununu allocated $1.5 million in CARES Act funds to be used for scholarships for private religious and homeschooling programs. Should religious institutions get public dollars and does that hurt public schools? And does that narrow the separation of church and state? First to Mr. Mayberry. I'm the only candidate in this race who served on a local school board in the great city of Dover, New Hampshire. So I understand this problem, very, this challenge very uniquely. And yes, John, as, because I feel that education should have school choice. I actually have advocated closing the Federal Department of Education, putting a padlock on that door and keeping the money right here in New Hampshire to educate our children. The money should follow the child, not the child have to chase the money to get to the best school they humanly can. So I favor school choice and that includes religious school choice. I want our children educated. If it's a religious school, a private charter school, a public charter school, a Montessori school, homeschooling, I want the children in New Hampshire to have the best foundation possibly going so they can enter the workforce. And Mr. Maurer, same question, please. Well, look, we should ensure that federal funding does not discriminate based on children based upon where they go to school. Uh, all children need to have the ability to go back into a classroom that they feel safe and healthy in. And so federal resources should be available for that. Um, but, you know, as we've just been speaking about, we do need to empower parents to actually have the decision about where they send their children to school. What we've seen from COVID-19 is that a lot of parents are going to be reevaluating the way that their children learn. 
Uh, we saw just this last spring that a lot of children were now going through uh, remote learning. And whether that's, those are tools that can be used for the future or not. We're going to see whether parents want their children going into a classroom in a traditional setting or not. And so I think this is a remarkable time for us to really be open-minded and creative in the way we're thinking, to ensure that parents are supported so that their children can go to the school of their choosing, where they can get the best quality education. And federal dollars should follow that. It shouldn't be uh, discriminate just based upon what some bureaucrat in D.C. wants to happen. Next question, Monica Hernandez. The commissioner of the FDA said in a recent interview that the agency would be willing to approve a COVID-19 vaccine before phase three clinical trials were complete. Some infectious disease experts have said early approval could seriously erode confidence in all vaccines. How concerned are you about the current vaccine trial process and do you think Americans will trust a COVID-19 vaccine? Mr. Mowers, we'll start with you. Well, look, it's important for anything that comes out to, of course, be safe for patients and for individuals. It should also then be up to the individuals to choose whether they feel safe taking that vaccine. That's up to individual choice and for individuals and families. Um, but the fact of the matter is I've worked with the FDA. Uh, they are a bureaucratic organization that often does not make decisions in the best interest of patients, but in the best interest in ensuring that they don't get sued. Uh, we need to change the mindset there. We're beginning to see that right now because of COVID-19. You know, treatments and therapies that would take five to 10 years are being developed in five to 10 months because we actually have uh, interest and we have the political will behind it right now. But we should be taking some of the ways that we've approached uh, COVID-19 and apply to a whole host of other therapies to ensure that the FDA is actually doing what's in the best interest of putting life-saving medications in the hands of patients and not trying to get in the way, the way they too often are. Mr. Mayberry, your response? I agree with Mr. Mowers. With the FDA trials going forward, and this should be an international effort, there are other countries who are developing vaccines, a lot of our allies. We need to move forward in a quick and aggressive way and be up to adults. The one thing I do not want to see is a national vaccine registry of who has it and who hasn't. I'm not a fan of national registries of any type for anything. So it will be up to the individual. I'm glad the FDA is working towards fast tracking. I applaud President Trump for fast tracking this, this approval, we're gonna get through this together and we're gonna get through it quickly and when the time is right. Next question comes from John. Thank you. If you are a new congressman in January and the leadership asks what the first expenditure should be to deal with the coronavirus, how would you answer? Let's start with Mr. Mayberry. Yes, the PPP program, I think was a very good job of helping keep our small businesses open. Uh, this afternoon, I was at a business here in Manchester. Her name is Chris, and she said she was able to stay open because of that PPP. I know restaurants and hotels that stayed open because of the PPP. That gave them a necessary lifeline that got them through this crisis and go forward. And Mr. Mowers. Well, thank you, John. You know, look, we shouldn't just be looking at what money we can spend for the current crisis, but what actions can be taken by the next Congress to prepare for the next one. In fact, the first piece of legislation I'll propose is one that incentivizes companies in the pharmaceutical space to move their manufacturing away from China and here to the United States. It's vitally important, uh, as well as for those in other key supply chain areas that are in our national security interests. This is unique time in American history. If we take the opportunity to learn from what we've seen the past few months and wisen up about how China remains a threat against the United States, we're going to be better prepared not just to respond to our current crisis, but for potential future crises. So that's the first thing I'd do. I'd also ensure that we're out there um, supporting our small businesses and continuing to do so. A lot of them have been hard hit. Some of my uh, good friends are restaurant owners right in Bedford. Uh, they actually supported Chris Pappas two years ago, but no longer do, in large part because he's left them behind. I won't forget them. Sounds like there's, in general, a lot of agreement here between the two candidates, but what differences do you think there might be in terms of handling the COVID-19 pandemic? Mr. Bowers, what differences do you have with Mr. Mayberry on this? Well, I just bring a different set of experience. You know, I have tackled global pandemics before, so I've got integral knowledge in exactly how we can actually approach these, how we can work with the private sector, how we can work with institutions of faith, how we can ensure that parents and individuals that I come in contact with on the campaign trail have the uh, comfort knowing that uh, ultimately, we're putting our best interests forward, our best faith forward to get life back to normal. Uh, so I think that's the difference I bring. Mr. Mayberry, how about you? How will you help tackle this once in a century problem differently than Mr. Mowers? 
because I'm the New Hampshire guy. I've been here 35 years. I understand what it's like to work with small businesses. My opponent arrived here in January and three weeks later filed for Congress. So it's great he has a global perspective. I'm going to bring that New Hampshire perspective because I'm going to be the New Hampshire congressman. I'm going to work with the small businesses and the restaurants, get them the care and information they need so they can keep their employees going, they can keep their businesses afloat, and they can keep our economy moving forward. This is important. We need a New Hampshire congressman. Chris Pappas went down to Washington and he forgot all about us. If Nancy Pelosi doesn't give him his marching orders for that day, he is completely lost. We need a leader. We need someone who will enter the fray and help New Hampshire. It's nice to have a great global perspective. I went to 63 countries. I've seen a lot in my world as a, as a U.S. veteran. But I bring that New Hampshire perspective. I found 200 gallons when law enforcement didn't Mr. have Mayberry. anything. I found 2,000 fast masks. And I found 25 Chromebooks for low-income that's kids. That's time. Mr. Mowers, you're going to get 30 seconds respond. to respond there. Absolutely. Thanks, Adam. You know, look, Matt, Matt Mayberry and I have known each other for almost a decade now. In fact, I met him my first day on the job as executive director of the Republican Party, gosh, I guess about seven years ago now. Uh, you know, we've been friends for a long time, so he knows what it, the accusation he throws around just isn't true. Uh, but that's okay. We're seven days from an election right now. Six by the time this airs. I'm sure there'll be a lot more that uh, comes our way. But uh, ultimately, this is about the issues that matter to the people of New Hampshire and our country because the stakes are too high. All right, gentlemen, let's shake things up with a little bit of a lightning round here, branching out to some topics we might not be able to cover uh, in the longer questions. Please do keep your answers to 15 seconds or less. Uh, starting with you, Mr. Mowers, uh, if you're elected, who would you invite to your first State of the Union? I would, elect, uh, I would invite uh, Chief Capano, who's retiring today, uh, because he has done such a remarkable job for the city of Manchester, our state, and I want to show how committed I am to supporting our law enforcement community. How about you, Mr. Mayberry? Uh, if you're elected, who would you invite to that first State of the Union? I would invite Kevin Abbott. He's a police officer in Durham, New Hampshire. I carry his challenge coin in my pocket because he wears a bulletproof vest to work so you don't have to. He goes to work at 11 o'clock at night so you can stay home with your kids. I support our law enforcement and I have some announcements tonight. I was endorsed by uh, Merrimack and Summersworth Police <laughs> Associations Mayberry. tonight. Thank you. We appreciate it. 15 seconds on the answer there. Uh, this one's going to you, Mr. Mayberry, first. Do you believe that the Washington football team did the right thing by ending the use of the nickname Redskins? That's a, uh, that is a decision of that football franchise and the owners. I was you know, Commissioner of Human Rights for the state of New Hampshire, and I believe it's a, a corporate decision, and they made it. How about you, Mr. Mowers? Did they use the right judgment by ending the nickname Redskins? Well, they certainly have a right to do it, but uh, ultimately that's, that's up to every individual. I do think that uh, too often we're trying to, you know, just get into the weeds of different words and meanings and things like that. I, but, you know, they absolutely have a right to do it. Okay, a little lighter one here. Apple picking season has started. What's your favorite type of apple to pick and at which orchard are you doing it, Mr. Mowers? Max apples. Any, any particular favorite there, Honeycrisp? I mean... <laughs> <laughs> oh, whichever one my wife is going to help me bake into a pie on that weekend. Usually. Good answer. All right, Mr. Mayberry, how about you? Honey crisp at the Mary Hill Farm, because they also have trails I can go for a walk around. All right. Mr. Mayberry, who do you believe is the most gifted leader in America who's not a politician? The Pope. All right, how about you, I Mr. I think that he... Go ahead, you can oh, take the rest of your 10 there. No, the Pope. All right. Mr. Mowers, uh, most gifted leader in America, not a politician. I think it's everyone who's putting their lives on the line every day for us. So anyone who wears a uniform, whether it's a veteran or whether it's in law enforcement, has my utmost respect because of their leadership abilities. And Mr. Mowers, can you name a specific Democrat in Congress, not from New Hampshire, who you look forward to working with on Capitol Hill? And we're looking for a name here and why. Sure. Well, I'll tell you, I think I can work with Barbara Lee. She's a far left, wacko liberal Democrat. Uh, but actually, I was able to help work with her to get the reauthorization of our global HIV program done. I look forward to working with her on those issues moving forward as well. Mr. Mary Berry, how about you? A Democrat you'd work with on Capitol Hill? Shelley Pingree from Maine. Because in the Seacoast, we have the Portsmouth Naval Shipyard with 7,800 jobs. We have seven members of the New Hampshire fishing fleet that will fish out the Georges Banks. We've got to protect those fishing jobs. We've got to keep those jobs at the Portsmouth Naval Shipyard. I'll work with her to get those jobs done.
Okay, we're done with our lightning round and now getting into some of the heavier topics this nation has grappled with more directly since the killing of George Floyd three months ago. In the spirit of being clear and direct on issues of race in America, we're asking for very simply a yes or no answer to this question before we dig a little deeper. Mr. Mowers, does systemic racism exist in the United States, yes or no? I believe that there are individuals who are racist, and I you know, think that folks who bring that racism into the job place should be held accountable for it. Um, but the fact of the matter is that uh, what we saw was a tragedy out in Minneapolis, but it doesn't justify the rioting, the looting that we're seeing, or the fact that politicians have turned their back on law enforcement. So is that a yes or a no? No. Mr. Mayberry, does systemic racism exist in the United States, yes or no? No, and as a Commissioner of Human Rights for the State of New Hampshire, appointed by Chris Nunu, I look forward to delving into this subject more. So, gentlemen, there is an unrelenting call for change in this country by some Americans who do think systemic racism has led to years of poverty, injustice, and a lack of adequate education, and also police brutality. While you don't agree, how would you represent constituents who do? And what do you say to communities of color who have that life experience? Mr. Mowers, you first. Sure. Well, look, I've had conversations with the NAACP and the National Diversity Council on these issues. I think it's very important for their uh, opinion to be heard. But I'll tell you, this is how radical Chris Pappas is. The fact that on one side you have myself, the NAACP here in New Hampshire, New Hampshire's law enforcement, and even Gene Shaheen and Maggie Hassan, who say that Chris Pappas's vote to remove qualified immunity would undermine our law enforcement. On the other side, you have Chris Pappas. That just tells you how extreme he has gotten on these issues, and we need to ensure that we're working in a constructive dialogue with New Hampshire's leaders the way that we have been by t reaching out to a diverse group of people for their opinion on these issues. Now, look, there are individual issues in law, law uh, I'm sorry, police departments across the country, but here in New Hampshire, we actually could be held up as a model, our law enforcement officers and processes, because many of the reforms being talked about in Washington, D.C. are already done here in New Hampshire. And so instead of de degrading police officers the way Chris Pappas has, I'll support them and hold them up as a national model. Mr. Mayberry, how do you represent constituents who believe systemic racism does exist? Through the example that I set as one of the commissioners of human rights for the state of New Hampshire. That's when we educate, we communicate, if need be, we adjudicate. There are forms of discrimination here in New Hampshire. It could be ageism. It could be discrimination against women. And we also see religious discrimination here. But we need to come together and follow the leader or the leadership of Governor Chris Sununu, who created an independent panel to review this, who appointed me and gave me the mandate of eradicating discrimination here in New Hampshire. And we've done so very well. Ani Malachi, who's the executive director, does an amazing job. But Adam, we need to continue to communicate, educate, and adjudicate. And if there's violence involved, the conversation stops. Next question comes from Monica Hernandez. Well, the latest high profile police involved shooting of a black man, Jacob Blake in Wisconsin, resulted in unrest and violence in that city, including a 17 year old who was arrested and charged with shooting three people, killing two. The president has hinted at using the Insurrection Act, which would allow the military above and beyond the National Guard to get involved in quelling violence. This would be an extraordinary act. It was last used 30 years ago. Under what circumstances, if any, would you support that move? Mr. Mayberry, we'll start with you. I think anytime you don't have access to federal office buildings, the U.S. Postal Service, if the actions of others infringe your freedom and quiet enjoyment of the services of our federal government, that's wrong. You need to be guaranteed access to it. Anytime there is destruction or rioting or looting, the governors need to step up and get this job done because they're not. The only reason why President Trump talks about this is because the governors are letting the anarchy just run wild. That's wrong. There are law-abiding citizens who can't enjoy where they live because of the, routine, the looting and the rioting. Mr. That's Mowers, wrong. your response? Well, look, any time you lose a life, it's a tragedy, no doubt. Uh, but the fact of the matter is that the people of Kenosha, the people of Wisconsin, the people in Portland have been let down by their local leaders and their state governors who are not taking strong action to actually ensure that people can feel safe in their communities. And fortunately, here in New Hampshire, we saw a totally different reaction. 
you go back to the middle of June when you had some folks who were peacefully protesting. They had a candlelight vigil, and God bless them for their right to do that. But then you also had folks who were trying to uh, incite violence who threw fireworks and water bottles at our law enforcement. But our governor and Chief Capano and others in, New in Ma Manchester said that enough is enough and actually ensured that there was a p presence from law enforcement so that it did not get out of hand. And so I think we have to uh, look at, evaluate every situation um, one at a time, individually. Uh, what we're seeing right now, Wisconsin and Oregon, is failing the people there. And I think the president's right to consider using the Insurrection Act in those cases. Now, what federal laws or regulations would you propose to revamp police training and more effectively hold police officers responsible if they abuse their power to use excessive or deadly force? Mr. Mayberry? I think it's a state issue. It's a local department issue. I don't think the federal government has any mandate in dictating policy that goes back to the states. I'm a states rights guy. I like the decisions being made as local as humanly possible. It's up to individual municipalities, what works for them and their department and their community. The measures that will be taken in Manchester, New Hampshire, may not be the same as taken in Tamworth, New Hampshire. And the governor has done a good job of leading on this once again. And so I look to the states and our local communities and also our police associations. Tonight I was endorsed by the Merrimack Police Association and the Summersworth Police Association. Steve Arnold, who is the state director of the New Hampshire Police Association personally endorsed me. I understand police officers and they understand me. Thank you. Mr. Mowers, your response? Well, look, my, my opinion on this comes from having conversations with law enforcement, whether it's our state troopers, rank and file patrolmen, or various police chiefs. The fact of the matter is that we should actually be providing more resources. We're asking them to do more and more every single day in their communities, whether it's handling issues of mental health, whether it's handling issues of drug addiction, or whether it's increasing violent crime in certain cities around the country, we need to ensure that police, our police officers are resourced and treated with respect with elected officials who have their back. Unfortunately, Chris Pappas and Nancy Pelosi are giving a lot of room for this defund the police conversation. It's wrong and it's reckless. If anything, I would support providing more funding so that police officers are able to work with mental health counselors, as they often do in many cases already, so that they can actually go out on these calls together, and to also ensure that they have the resources necessary for the training standards that they work on with their state uh, elected officials as well. Next question comes from John DeStaso. Thank you. We've heard from the current congressional delegation about changes at the postal operations in New Hampshire, <clears throat> causing delays for some veterans and their families receiving prescriptions in the mail. How concerned are you about these issues? Would you support emergency funding for the Postal Service? And if not, how would you fix the delays? With uh, Matt Mowers first. Thank you, John. You know, look, I've had these conversations with some folks at the post office, actually right out of Manchester, as well as regular carriers as well. Uh, and what they've told me is that they feel fully confident that they're able to actually deliver the mail that's needed. Uh, I mean, obviously, we want to ensure that seniors have access to their medications and veterans are receiving the assistance they need. Uh, we saw the Postal Service do a great job for those who didn't have direct deposit uh, as a result of COVID-19 uh, when they were being provided stimulus funding. Um, but the fact of the matter is that this shouldn't be a political football. Uh, Chris Pappas, once again, is playing politics with this issue. Uh, I have faith in the Postal Service to do their job. I have faith in them because I've spoken to them and I know it. And Matt Mayberry? I have friends in the Postal Service, and we've had this conversation before. And along with what Mr. Mawa said, they have faith they can get the job done, and I have faith in them. No one's going to work harder than Granite Staters to make sure Granite Staters are cared for. And so I support our Postal Service. They do a good job, and they're going to make sure our veterans and all seniors get their medication in a timely fashion. Next question comes from Monica Hernandez. Uh, Mr. Mayberry, you label yourself as pro-choice, but you support parental notification, a ban on late-term abortion, a waiting period, and a restriction on federal funding for Planned Parenthood. Mr. Mowers, you label yourself as pro-life, with exceptions for the life of the mother, and say you want to find common ground in cases of rape and incest. Is Mr. Mayberry taking a politically expedient position and not restrictive enough on this issue? Mr. Mowers. Well, look, this is just an issue where folks can disagree, and there are good people on both sides who can disagree on this. I happen to be pro-life, always have been. Uh, you know, Mr. Mayberry is pro-choice. He always has been. 
Um, but, you know, my belief in this is also grounded in experience. You know, I've traveled the world and seen how much effort and resources the United States puts into saving lives around the world. I've seen women with baby on their hip, babies on their hips in sub-Saharan Africa who thank the American people uh, for providing help to the, them for keeping their babies alive. And so I've always valued life and I will continue to do so. Mr. Mayberry believes in abortion. Uh, that's his right and it's certainly one where we can have policy disagreements. Mr. Mayberry, do you think Mr. Mowers and the Republican Party are too restrictive on this issue? I think Mr. Mowers is wrong in his assessment of me. Because when you look at the New Hampshire right to life, they would categorize Mr. Mowers as pro-choice because he allows for the same exceptions that, that I do. In my first 100 days of con in, as a congressman, I'll introduce born alive legislation. I believe in, um, I believe in parental notification. I believe in no money at all for Planned Parenthood. I put my money where my mouth is, my actions behind my words. I'm a member of the Association of the Foster and Adoptive Families Program. There are 900 children who are waiting to be adopted here in New Hampshire. And I try to help them find a home, and I try to help them find activities to, to keep them engaged with their families. It's one where, during this, during this campaign, I've actually become, through faith and prayer and conversations, more conservative, where Mr. Bowers has gone from being strictly pro-life to now allowing exceptions and now introducing the that's bargaining time. chip of common ground on rape and incest. Mr. Mayberry, that's time. We have the same position. Mr. Mayberry, uh, let's take 15 seconds for you to respond. Yeah, if I could. I mean, look, that's news to me that May Matt Mayberry's converted. I mean, we always welcome the converted. I just take question with the fact that happened seven days before a primary election. Uh, you know, Matt Mayberry and I have known each other a long time. He's always been pro-choice. Just last week, he told someone he believes that uh, abortion should be an option for the first eight weeks of pregnancy. Uh, so, you know, I guess he's not just pro-choice, but maybe multiple choice. Uh, but that's a new opinion to, that he's expressed here tonight. Mr. Mayberry, the brief response. The eight weeks comes from Adam. Yeah, the eight weeks come from rape, incest, and life of the mother. I am much more restrictive on that. I believe in parental notification. I believe in a waiting period. I will be a pro-life vote in Congress. Welcome to the team, Matt. Next question comes from John DeStaso. Thank you. Mr. Mayberry, the state Republican Party platform recognizes marriage as, a, quote, the sacred union between one man and one woman as ordained by God, close quote. You're openly gay and very much in favor of individual freedoms. Does this platform position offend you, and would you work to change it as an influential congressman? It doesn't offend me because it's a party platform. Federal law allows marriage between two loving adults. That the Republican Party is made up of lots of ideals and you know, across the ideological spectrum. I've worked for 35 years electing Republicans, those who are more conservative than I am and those who may be more liberal than I am. But they all have one thing in common. They're a Republican, John. And I think we need to get back our state house, our state legislature. We need to keep the governorship. We need to fire Chris Pappas. We need to fire Gene Shaheen and replace him with the Republicans. 35 years I've been working to elect Republicans. And that platform plank has been there, and that hasn't slowed me down one bit. And Mr. Mowers, as executive director of the NHGOP, uh, you did not actively work to change that part of the platform on same-sex marriage, to my knowledge. Do, uh, do you support same-sex marriage now? And if so, will you work to change the platform as an influential congressman? Well, look, I'm a live free or die Republican. I believe that's up to individuals to choose who they uh, want to love and who they want to live with and who they want to cohabitate with um, and who they choose to marry. In fact, I believe that government should get out of the business of marriage. Um, I don't think it's government's job to be telling us who we can live with or who we can love. Um, you know, so, you know, whether my and when I was executive director, my job was simply uh, to provide an avenue for delegates to choose the platform they chose. Uh, so I was not a voting member of the state delegate. I was a staff member, um, but that's the platform that the party chose. But ultimately, my personal opinion is that folks should be able to love and live with who they choose to. Monica Hernandez has the next question. Mr. Mowers, President Trump has endorsed you. Are there any areas where you think he should be doing things differently? 
Well, look, I, I think one thing that's been lost in the first few years is a prioritization on reducing spending. Uh, you know, we did propose a budget uh, early on that reduced federal spending, uh, but unfortunately a Republican Congress, and this is the problem, you can't just send any Republican down to Washington, D.C., because any other Republican who goes along to get along, especially on spending, is ultimately going to spend more money. Um, but we do need to prioritize getting control of our federal deficit uh, down in Washington, D.C. The only way we're going to do that is by sending strong conservative leaders who are actually willing to prioritize it. And that's a priority I'm willing to make. It's one that I've actually backed up with my deeds. We proposed cutting our own budget when I was at the State Department because we knew we could do more with less. And so we need to be taking that attitude to every other piece of government. And so I hope that's a priority in a second term. And to be clear here, what cuts would you make? Well, look, Monica, there is ex extensive discretionary funding that could be cut. Um, and so I would first and foremost show that we're serious about getting control of our deficit by reducing the size of the federal bureaucracy and also reducing the size of the overall federal budget. Uh, I think that will be a great step in the right direction of getting control of our deficit and debt. Mr. Mayberry, you're a strong supporter of President Trump. Do you think he has unfairly influenced this primary by making an endorsement? The president can endorse anyone he wishes, because I recall that in 2016, when Matt Mowers was working for Governor Chris Christie, they would be in the tower of Donald Trump. I introduced him five times around the state of New Hampshire as a 2016 and a 2020 Trump delegate. So I support this president. I'm looking forward to voting for him again. I look forward to campaigning with him and putting his signs around New Hampshire. He's done a great job for America. He's going to do a much better job in the second term. And I look forward to it. I have 600 New Hampshire endorsements. I have Gover Senator John E. Sununu, Governor Craig Benson and Steve Merrill, Chuck Morse, 600 community leaders. These folks serve on school boards and planning boards and town councilors. I'm the New Hampshire candidate in this race. I did not get all kinds of Washington endorsements. That's fine because they can't vote for them. But 600 New Hampshire people standing by my side and fighting for what's the New Hampshire advantage, I'll take that all day long. Next question, John DeSeso. Thank you. Earlier this year, targeted U.S. airstrikes killed Iranian General Soleimani. The Trump administration cited the 2002 authorization of use of military force for, its, for the Iraq war as its legal justification for the killing. Should the president have the power to order the assassination of foreign government officials? And if not, what changes would you make to the 2002 authorization? Mr. Mayberry. This is not a foreign leader, it's a terrorist who has killed thousands of people. I was in Sandwich, New Hampshire, and I saw a movement memorial that was 7,200 dog tags of men and women who have died in the global war on terror. Soleimani was a parasite on this world who needed to be picked off and eliminated. I congratulate President Trump. We need strong action in dealing with terrorists. If we take a soft-handed, like, let's just talk about our approach, that's wrong. We rule with an iron fist when it comes to protecting our citizens for chasing down terrorists and keeping our country safe. So I think of those 7,200 people who gave their lives on the war on terror, and I'm glad Soleimani's dead. And Mr. Mowers, same question, please. Yeah, Soleimani's back where he belongs, which is right in hell right now, uh, given what he's done to our troops in the Mideast. The fact of the matter is he was one of the largest sponsors of terrorism in this world. He propped up militia groups around the Mideast, targeting American troops as well as our ally Israel. He, the president was right to take the action he did and need to be taken. By the way, talk about a course correction from where we were in the Obama administration. You know, I was there on inauguration day uh, at the State Department, leading our new political appointees at the State Department. We had to clean up the mess that the Obama administration left us. The fact that ISIS was running rampant through the Mideast. The fact that they had sent a bunch of cash on a plane to a bunch of thugs in Tehran to buy their uh, agreement and bribe them to be part of the Iran nuclear deal. That did not stop them from obtaining a nuclear weapon down the road. It did nothing to stop the type of paramilitary activity that Soleimani was culpable of. So the president was right to do it. It needed to happen. And American lives are now protected because of the actions the president took. 
Next question from Monica Hernandez. There is a push in this country for combating climate change by developing energy that is not from fossil fuels. Nuclear power is an option. The Seabrook 2 nuclear reactor was proposed and partially constructed, but never finished. Would you support reviving and completing that project to meet New Hampshire's energy needs? And should more nuclear plants be built in the U.S.? Mr. Mayberry. Yes, and I think we should open up all options for nuclear uh, for nuclear power, but also for energy here in our great nation. New Hampshire has one of the largest and highest electric bills in the country. So any option that will lower those electric bills so we can bring in more business and allow those businesses currently here to expand, that's a very good thing. So I'm an all-in for energy option. Mr. Mowers. Well, you know, we may have to drag my dad out of retirement in order to get him to work on this one, since he was actually a diver on the construction of the uh, first uh, Seabrook power plant that was constructed, working on the cooling, uh, uh, the different cooling pipes. But uh, I do support an all of the above approach. We see too many working class families who are hurting every single, especially during the winter, uh, because of the lack of energy resources here in New England. We do have the highest energy costs in the country. And uh, we need to do, be taking an all of the above approach in order to ensure that we can lower energy costs for working class families. It's a vitally important issue and one I look forward to leading on. Next question from John. There has been a lot of state and federal money spent to deal with the opioid crisis in New Hampshire. Yet earlier this summer, Manchester saw its highest number of overdoses in about a year. Is more money the answer? If so, what should it be spent on? If money's not the answer, what is? Mr. Mowers? Yeah, look, this is a, uh, an issue that hits close to home, not just for me, but for all of us. You know, I have family that suffered from addiction. And it's really challenging for any family to go through uh, because even the good days sometimes we fall by really bad days. And that's why we need to be really smart about how we approach this. Uh, whether it's about building the wall on the southern border to stop the influx of legal drugs, something I've learned from firsthand through briefings when I was at the State Department about how illegal drugs cross the southern border and come up to here in northern New England and then reach our communities and poison people. Uh, whether it's the efforts that have been taken to stop the mailing of fentanyl from the mail in China. But we also need to ensure that we're backing up the governor's hub and spoke model, making sure that there's resources available. So when folks do check themselves in, because they finally recognize that they need help, they finally recognize that there might be a helping hand on the other side, that there's treatment options for them immediately that day. Because I can tell you, if you don't have someone check themselves into inpatient care that day, you may lose them, you may lose them forever. And too many families have suffered too much that I've been speaking with across the Grand State because of this, these tragedies. And Mr. Mayberry. I've talked to those who are in recovery, those who run recovery centers. We need to end the supply coming up from our southern border. President Trump has built a 15-foot high wall. I want to continue at 15 feet down so there are no tunnels through there. Where we have open deserts, hundreds of miles of open desert, let's, do, let's use drone technology and patrol that. Cut the flow in here. Let's support the governor and the hub and spoke model. But also, let's not defund or dismantle the police department. We need to give them the tools they need because those men and women are truly on the very front line. Our um, ATF, our um, DEA, those agents need to be supported. They've been short funded. We need to expand that. And if we need to have troops on our border to stop this flow, so be it. Next question from Monica Hernandez. Mr. Mowers, Mr. Mayberry has said that the Trump administration's policy to separate families at the U.S.-Mexico border was wrong, arguing that the family is the foundation of society. Mr. Mowers, you are an outspoken supporter of President Trump. Do you support the family separation policy? Well, let me just say that first and foremost, that was actually an Obama administration policy that was continued on. Um, but with that aside, look, I support the president's immigration policies, whereas Mr. Mayberry has said he opposes the president's immigration policies. I think we need to get tough on the southern border to stop the influx of illegal drugs and also ensure the security on the southern border because we should have an absolute right to know who's coming into our country. Now, look, we all encourage legal immigration, but the fact of the matter is that with the threat of coyotes, uh, who are human trafficking on the southern border, you have to take actions to ensure that people are actually coming across with their, on their own will, and not just because someone's be paying them to smuggle them across the border, whether it's for illicit purposes and human trafficking. Uh, so I support the President's decision and his policies. I, I guess based off of what you say, Mr. Bar Mayberry opposes them. 
Mr. Mayberry, you've broken from the president on that family separation policy. Why is he wrong? Well, first of all, you know, I like how Mr. Myers has brought New Jersey politics into New Hampshire. I've never said I disagree with the president's policy on immigration at all. I actually agree with Ivanka Trump when she said that she felt family separation was wrong. To disagree on one item of the national plan on immigration is wrong. And that's a mischaracterization. It's that New Jersey politics coming up here to New Hampshire. I do hope that we get a chance sometime tonight, because if Mr. Myers is going to take credit for President Trump, I want to hold him responsible for the actions of Governor Chris Christie. Uh, we haven't talked about Governor Christie yet, and I look forward to it because he's the worst governor on the Second Amendment. He is, you know, he brought forward a 23 cent a gallon gas tax into New Jersey. So if we're going to talk about me, let's talk about Chris Christie. Mr. Mowers, 30 seconds to respond there. Thanks, Adam. You know, you know, I don't know, Matt Mayberry seems so obsessed with New Jersey, maybe he should run there. You know, I'm focused on representing the people of New Hampshire. And the folks I talk to, regardless of where I travel, want to be strong on the southern border to ensure that our security interests are protected and also ensure that we're protecting American jobs. And those are things, by the way, that Chris Pappas and Nancy Pelosi have led us behind on. They have failed American workers. They prioritized uh, open immigration policies that will let down American workers, especially when they let China even get off the hook. Gentlemen, but it's 2020 actually, in the U.S. If you're actually, if you're act, go ahead, go ahead, if Mr. Mayor. If Matt was actually from New Hampshire, we wouldn't have to spend any time talking about these deep roots in New Hampshire. He left college. He went to Rutgers in, in New Jersey, went to work for Chris Christie, came to New Hampshire, and left. And he came back in January and three weeks later filed for Congress. This is a New Jersey politician who came to New Hampshire, saw a seat, trying to grab it, and I think that's wrong. Chris Christie was the worst Second Amendment governor in the nation. He passed a 23 cent a gallon gas tax that cost $2 billion on the New Jersey taxpayers. Mr. Mr. Myers can't come up and you can't buy 12 flannel shirts from L.L. Bean and say you're a granite stater. Mr. Mayor, got to be here if, for I a while. if I could just really quickly, yeah, look, I'm honored to receive the highest rating from the NRA because they know I'm a strong supporter of our Second Amendment. And the fact of the matter is that, you know, these types of attacks I expect from Chris Pappas and the Democratic Party. But, you know, Matt, Matt Mayberry is trying to launch attacks against my wife. He's trying to launch attacks against me continuously through his campaign. I get it. He's been upset because the President of the United States endorsed me, and that's when his attack started. If you go back actually a year ago, just now, Mr. Mayberry called me and encouraged me to run for this seat, actually. Uh, so I guess, look, we're seven days away from an election. The President of the United States in my corner. Mr. Mayberry, unfortunately, is going to say a lot of things that just aren't true over the next seven days. Gentlemen, we need to Mr. move Mayer's on. We're going to get a final on, question but, to Mr. Mayberry but, here. So this district has ping-ponged between Democrats and Republicans for years. Whichever party wins this time, that candidate will need to represent all of the constituents of CD1. What is it about you that appeals to people throughout the political spectrum? And we're going to start with Mr. Mowers. Well, look, the fact of the matter is that I have a background a lot like, like folks everywhere. You know, a middle-class family that had to pick up and move when their dad's job site changed. Someone who understands what you have to go through when you have a family member that struggles with addiction. Someone who's also had the great ability to achieve their piece of the American dream. You know, to go from a guy, the son of a guy who is diving on the Seabrook power plant to having the opportunity to work for the President of the United States and the Secretary of State was a remarkable opportunity. But also because I've shown that we can bring people together. You know, I talked about my work in uh, running our global HIV program. That act program was actually up for reauthorization the year I was there, the few years I was there. And what we did is we actually brought people together, liberal Democrats and conservative Republicans, to reauthorize that bill because it was in the best interest of American security as well as the moral and right thing to do for our world. Um, you know, so I've, people can count on me because I've already done it. Mr. Mayberry, how do you appeal to people across the political spectrum? I've won election to five years serve on the Dover City Council and a two-year term on the Dover School Board. I can run across the spectrum. I also bring the New Hampshire perspective because the challenge that I have right now sitting here is that Mr. Myers committed an ethics violation on his federal filing. He failed to disclose an $810,000 condominium in Washington, D.C., but rents a studio apartment here in uh, Bedford. His wife works for CNN. He failed to disclose her income as required by the ethics. He got $100,000 for three speeches in Korea. 
On Friday, he left a $58,000 a year job with the State Department, and on Monday morning, delivering a $100,000 speech in Korea. That epitomizes the swamp. We send people to work in the federal government to benefit all of us, not to become millionaires. Mr. Mowers is a millionaire. We sent one 30-year-old millionaire to Washington once, and That's he time. failed. Mr. I do not want to do it again. Mr. Mayberry, 30 seconds to respond, Mr. Mowers. Well, look, that's news to me. Um, I, I, you know, I, I wouldn't be opposed to being a millionaire, but I'm certainly not one. Look, you know, Matt Mayberry can, can lob all the inaccurate and incorrect lies that he wants. None of what he just said is true. And in fact, if people want to see it, they can go on the House website and they can see it because it's all right there. It's all perfectly transparent and by the book. I mean, I'm an Eagle Scout. I'm not going to cut corners on this. We're fully transparent on this. And every single piece of information that Mr. Mayberry said, we've done in compliance with the law and it's available on the House website. Unfortunately, Mr. Mayberry may have just misread the directions on this. Gentlemen, that's no, time. We've given each to, candidate to, time for a closing Adam, statement. This, this no, no, we've got to move no, to Adam, closing statements, sir. It's each candidate gets time for a closing yeah. statement. And we begin with you, Mr. Mayberry. You do have time. Great. Thank you for taking time to watch this evening. As you saw from the last hour, you know, I'm not as articulate and as polished as Mr. Mowers, but I want to re represent you. I've worked with you for 35 years. I fought for New Hampshire families, and I'll continue to do so. I didn't give a $100,000 speech in Korea. The federal, FE the federal FEC or the federal compliance says you have to list an asset. Mr. Mowers owns an $800,000 condominium in Washington, D.C., and rents a studio apartment in New Hampshire. He bought 12 plaid shirts and says, I'm from New Hampshire. He's poured money, New Jersey money, trying to buy a congressional race. I want to represent you every day. Please go to MayberryForCongress.com to learn more. And I hope I can earn your vote on September 8th, please. Mr. Mowers, your closing statement. Well, thank you, Adam and Monica and John and for everyone at WMUR for having us. You know, look, despite what we just heard, here's what really matters. We need a new generation of conservative leadership to go down to Washington, D.C. and take on the radical socialist agenda that we see down there. We need someone who's actually going to represent the people of New Hampshire when Chris Pappas has left us behind. Someone who's going to stand with law enforcement because they've worked with law enforcement. Someone who's going to hold China accountable because, like I did at the State Department, I held China accountable. Someone who's going to represent New Hampshire's middle class families, not leave them behind and leave them with a bigger tax bill the way that Chris Pappas has. So over the course of the next few days, before September 8th, and then to November 3rd, I look forward to earning your vote and earning your trust, because we need someone who's going to represent us and not just Nancy Pelosi the way that Chris Pappas has. We do want to thank the candidates for their time tonight and the panelists for being part of this debate. And of course, we thank you for joining us for these Granite State debates. Tomorrow, we're going to hear from the Republicans running in New Hampshire's second congressional district. And if you missed any part of tonight's debate, you will be able to find it on our website and mobile app. Have a good night.